Hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to week two of our Water Productivity Masterclass series. Uh, we had a really nice showing last week, and, and we're excited to see everyone here again this week. Um, my name is Lauren Zielinski. I work on the Water PIP project team at IHE Delft, and today I'll be moderating the, the webinar uh, along with Abraham Abishek from Meta Meta, um, and he's also our technical guide. So if you have any questions um, about your connection or audio or video, please message him and he can help you. Um, just to remind you that this masterclass series is brought to you by the Water PIP Project, which is the Water Productivity Improvement in Practice. And that is a, a group of organizations focused on water science and water management, and we're looking at improving water productivity in the agricultural sector. So um, I put it in the chat, but we would like you all to introduce yourselves in the chat box uh, with your name where the institute that you work for and the country that you're living in, it really helps us understand who is attending these webinars and how we can engage with you better in the future. So today is week two of six of the webinar series. Last week we focused on introducing the concept of water productivity and how to monitor it. This week, we'll be focusing on the WAPOR portal and how to monitor different parameters of water productivity using that data. Uh, this week, we'll focus more on how to use the, the portal online on the, on the web. And next week, we'll get more advanced into topics on how to use the data and analyze the data in GIS and Python. The following week, we will look at water productivity and sugarcane production and the specific aspects with that crop and then followed by looking at different socioeconomic water productivity parameters. And the final week, we'll, we'll be using AquaCrop to monitor different parameters as well. So if you would like to rewatch the recording from today or look at the presentations that were made um, or from this week or previous weeks, you can go to the project website. That is waterpipun ihe.org and that website should go live later this week so that's a good central location for that information and you can also go to the water channel at www.thewaterchannel.tv and all the powerpoints and videos will be there so our agenda for today is we will start with a short video introducing wapor uh, that comes from the water channel and then our colleague at ih delft ihe delft marlus mool will talk about uh, the WAPOR portal in more details, uh, the ins and the outs of WAPOR. That will be followed by Pulad Karimi, also from IHE Delft, who will talk about different WAPOR-based indicators. And then uh, Vic Tran, our, our another colleague from IHE Delft, will show, our, show a video about how to use the tool and the portal. And then at the end, we'll have about 30 minutes for a question and answer session. So we will not answer questions in between the different presentations, but we encourage you to ask them in the chat box, and Abraham will be collecting the questions, and then we will answer them all at the end. So, so please be engaged in that chat box, and we'll try and answer as many questions as possible. If we don't get to your question, we'll also collect them and, and answer them separately and put them on the website, so you still have access to that information. So I think with that, we can start with the, the first video. FAO has developed Vapor, a remote sensing database which allows for the monitoring of agricultural water productivity. Vapor gives users access to a wide variety of real-time satellite data on water productivity collected over a span of 10 years. This information can be used to propose solutions to increase water productivity while respecting the environment and making equitable use of water resources. Welcome, my name is Sam Bastiaanse of Meta Meta and welcome to these How to Use Vapor Tutorials. Vapor is an FEO platform and stands for Water Productivity Through Open Access of Remotely Sensed Derived Data. Vapor has a lot of data to offer and in these videos uh, I will show you how to collect this data. First you need a Vapor account. You can create an account right here. 
Mine says my vapor, that means that I'm already signed in. Vapor is currently two versions. Um, I'm using the latest version, version 2.1 now. Um, the Vapor database is divided into three skill levels continental, national, and subnational. Continental has a pressure resolution of 250 meters and it's available for all of Africa and the Middle East. Then you have national skill level. This is the pixel resolution of 100 meters, but it's only available in some countries in Africa and the Middle East. At last, you have subnational level, a pixel resolution of 30 meters. However, this one is only available for some areas uh, in Ethiopia, Lebanon, Kenya, Sudan, Mozambique, Mali, and Egypt. If you want to download and collect uh, Vapor data, you go to the left corner. And the first option is analysis. Here you can download and do your own analysis for your own area. I will show you this in the next videos. The second option is locate. Uh, you look, with locate, you can search for your own specific area. You can search for country, city, street, or place of interest. The third option is layers. The layers uh, will activate the, la the layer what you see at this moment. Um, for now, the gross biomass water productivity of 2019 is activated, the layer. If you want to remove this layer, uh, you can click on the bin button. Now there's no layer active. If you want to active another layer, you go to layers, then you click on theme, and you can activate a layer what you want. And also you can choose the own period what you want. What kind of data has Vapor to offer? Uh, all the databases uh, are shown in the catalog. So if I click on catalog, you can see all the databases. Um, you can see all the databases per skill level. Uh, the databases are going from evapotranspiration to net primary production to biomass to precipitation to a land surface temperature. Uh, this one is for the continental level. Uh, if you go to national and subnational, you can also search what's available for those skill levels. If you click on back to map, you go back to the main page. Um, this was a very short introduction of how to use Vapor and in the next videos I will show you how to collect this data. So thank you very much and see you next time. So that was just a short introduction on, on how to use the Vapor portal. Uh, if you would like to rewatch that video or there's more videos as well, you can go to the waterchannel.tv and they have more videos there. So I think now we'll pass it on to Marluce and she'll give us more information about the ins and outs of WAPOR. Thank you very much, uh, Lauren, and, uh, and, and thanks, Bas uh, Bastian, also for the, the introduction into WAPOR. So that's a brief idea of you know, the, the portal that we're going to talk about uh, today, uh, which is the WAPOR database that is hosted by, uh, by FEO. Um, oh, I need to check, click here to slide. To, to move the slides. So WAPO, what is WAPO? Um, so WAPO is a database of remote sensing derived data. Uh, I had a nice video here. I don't know why it's not uh, playing, but that's the same one in the video. Um, so it's a database of uh, remote sensing derived information that's related to water productivity. So the database was developed uh, as a tool to monitor uh, improvements in water productivity uh, for Africa and the Middle East uh, initially. Uh, and it's accessible through a portal. You already saw uh, some um, showing the portal and where to access the data. I'll go to in, in a little bit more detail later on, um, but uh, that is Vapor. Um, you also see uh, a link here to the website of the, the project that developed the Vapor database, and it's had a lot of information about what the database is and how it's being used. Um, so I'll just... Um, explain a little bit more of uh, the technical aspect of uh, this database. I don't know what's happening here. Um, so we have uh, three different levels um, at different resolutions. So we've got level one, which uh, covers the whole of Africa uh, and the Middle East. And that's available at 250 meter uh, data. And that's uh, the source of data is MODIS which is uh, available at a one-day um, um, interval. It passes by 
uh, but in the portal it's combined into a decadal uh, time step. So what do we mean with decadal? Uh, that's actually a time step of 10 days, um, but uh, there's a small caveat. Um, it covers three decades in a month. So if a month is 31 days, then you've got the last decade is actually 11 days, or for February the last decade is eight days. So that's a bit of a trick that you need to know when you're using the data. Uh, the second level is 100 meter resolution data uh, that's available at decadal monthly and annual time scales, but also at seasonal time scales. And later in the presentation, I will explain a bit what this seasonal is about. Uh, this is available for 21 countries. The list is provided here, but you can also find it on the website. And also for five river basins, the Jordan, Litani, Nile, Awash, and Niger uh, river basins. And this is uh, partly based on satellite information, also uh, the MODIS data and then resampled uh, prior to 2014. And after 2014, it's um, derived from the proba -V, which is an European satellite at 100 meter resolution. And then we have in specific locations for irrigation schemes and for the AWASH, for instance, uh, at sub-basin level, um, we have 30 meter resolution data um, at decadal, monthly, and seasonal time scale. And that's available for specific uh, locations. And currently, it is available for locations in Lebanon, Ethiopia, Mali, Egypt, uh, Kenya, Mozambique, and Sudan. And this is derived from the Landsat uh, data or the satellite that's available at 30 meter resolution. Uh, so this is what it looks like. This is the, the, the portal. You see uh, the areas where there is data. So the left-hand side is the, the map of Africa. So that's a 250-meter resolution data. You see it covers the whole extent of uh, Africa and the Middle East. And then on the right-hand side, you see the national level, which is the 100-meter level, where the countries are, with the colors, are the countries that have data at that level. So um, currently, uh, the, the website and the database um, offers uh, WAPOR version 2. But how did we get to this version 2? So WAPOR, uh, the project that developed the database started in 2015 or 2016, and they started developing the data sets. Um, and there was um, a beta version that was available uh, from 2015, uh, 2017, sorry. Uh, and that was evaluated by the project partners, and there were some improvements made, and a version 1 was launched in February 2018. Um, and that was uh, much improved from the beta version, and uh, it was available open access for everybody. So a lot of analysis, et cetera, were done with that database. Um, and also, again, internally, the project did in quality assessments on the database, and based on their recommendations, uh, there were improvements made on the database, and some major improvements were made regarding the underlying soil moisture product that is informing the ET data. And there was also a, a tweak towards um, ET and biomass production irrigated area, which were underestimated um, from the first version. And there was also another adjustment made based on the recommendation whereby the first version showed only the above ground biomass production with a fixed ratio, and we recommended that they should just report the total biomass production and then based on what you know on the ground you can uh, or you can calculate yourself the above ground portion. So since uh, June 2019, the version two with all these adjustments has been um, made online and it was officially launched during the international seminar on drought and agriculture, which was called counting crops and drops. Let's grow the future together, which was uh, held in Rome last year. So that's, that's what is currently available, and that's what, what we are using now for all the analysis. So the brief overview of the databases or the data sets that are available uh, on the, the WAPOR um, data set or on, on the, the portal. Uh, the main um, map or the main uh, data that uh, had why the, the database was developed is this gross um, biomass water productivity. Um, but there are also underlying data sets that have been used for these analysis, like uh, the actual evapotranspiration and interception um, data, which is available as a, a composite. But there's also a split between uh, or the individual uh, evaporation, uh, transpiration, and interception layers are also available. 
Then there's information on net primary production and above ground biomass production. There's also a layer on the land cover classification, and there's information on the phenology. And there's some other quality layers that are also available. But these are the main uh, layers that are required for water productivity analysis. Um, in the previous um, webinar, we, uh, Poulat talked a lot about water productivity. So I'm just as a reminder, I'm putting up the equation for uh, water productivity, which is the amount of biomass yield, but it could even be uh, economic um, output uh, against uh, how much input, and in this case, how much uh, water is being used to produce that. that. And the WAPO portal is separating it uh, into two um, components or two indicators, both gross, by, uh, gross water productivity and net water, pro water productivity, and the gross is by dividing it um, with the total ET, and the net is dividing uh, the biomass uh, by just the transpiration, so just the, uh, the amount of water that the plant is using. Well, ideally, you want to see, you know, what is the, the crop uh, production, but uh, at this stage, um, the VAPO portal is providing biomass uh, water productivity. Um, we, had, we received a lot of comments uh, at earlier stages about, you know, what is the value of the Vapor database. And, and since uh, the version 1 has been launched, there have been a various amount of uh, studies being done on the, the value of the database. And these are uh, three of the key publications that provide input into, you know, how well does the database uh, work against uh, observed data. So we have the WAPO quality assessment report that was um, published last year, and that actually evaluates each individual layer. And we have two key publications that came out this year about, uh, in particular, the evaporation product. So uh, these are also the data sets or the, the reports that I'm referring to when I'm uh, continuing with this presentation. So there's their results and, and analysis that are coming from these publications that I'm summarizing in this presentation. So just the background, WAPO is not the only um, product and database that is providing uh, evaporation. So on the evaporation side, uh, there are many, many projects, and there's a large variability between the products. And you also see that there's a difference in spatial and temporal res resolutions between the different products. So you know, why do we need this new database, and, and how much does it really add, and in, what is the quality compared to these other products? So in this uh, report, the quality assessment report from IHE and uh, FAO, we evaluated uh, a number of different products using a variety of methods. So one of the methods was uh, looking at the water balance of large river basins in Africa. So we evaluated the, the, yeah, the water balance. So we evaluated precipitation minus the discharge that we received from a global data set. And we compared that to the ET from WAPO. Um, so the graph shows the comparison, which is probably not very clear, but if we look at uh, the statistics, um, we compared uh, the average of the different products and the one with the precipitation minus the discharge. Um, we also did a weighted average, so we didn't, um, we gave more weight to the larger basins compared to the smaller basins, and we looked at the correlation. And you see that all the correlations are about 0 0.9 uh, compared to the, uh, the observed data. Um, but WAPO is on, together with, uh, in this case, WECAN, uh, the highest in terms of correlation. What is most, um, yeah, most important, what you see most, is that the, the difference between the observed data and some of these ET products is quite large. Like Gleam and MODIS have more than 200 millimeter out of uh, 700 or 800, 200 meet, millimeter difference. So that's almost 25% difference uh, of, of an absolute value. And you see here that Sebob and Vapor uh, provide the closest match with the observed data. So that's already a very nice indication that Vapor is actually performing um, amongst the best of the other uh, ET products. Uh, we also evaluated against uh, the discharge data in, um, in, in the uh, river basin in Lebanon, the Litani River Basin. Um, and you see 
I don't know if it's very clear, but you see the two different colors, um, dark green and dark blue. And we initially wanted to evaluate, evalu evaluated the flow, which is the dark green one, against the line, which is the P minus ET data from, from WAPOR. And it didn't match at all. But later we realized that there was an interbasin transfer uh, from one of the reservoirs there um, outside of the basin. If we added that up, we actually see that the water balance is, is closing uh, very nicely. Um, the other uh, uh, report or the other paper uh, from, uh, from Megan Blatchford, she also evaluated uh, a number of uh, point measurements and observed um, eddy covariance towers towards the, the WAPOR database. And you see that um, there is a general agreement, but there's also a large scatter around uh, the, the average. So what are the main conclusions from the ET products? Um, we see that uh, WAPOR is one of the highest spatial resolution compared to the other products. The other product, products are you know, of one kilometer or even higher. Uh, the data is provided near real time, which is also a major advantage. And at basin level, WAPOR is generally performing uh, very well. But we also saw that from uh, the report from uh, Megan shows that WAPOR is overestimating when ETA is low. Um, WAPO overestimate ET in irrigated fields, and WAPO misrepresents ETA when ETA is high in humid conditions. And especially the humid conditions, um, yeah, it's, it's probably related to the quality of the input data in terms of you know cloud cover that is affecting um, the the data. Um, also, what I would like to say is that uh, if you look at the the water balance. Um, ET is not the only product that is included here. Um, it's also the uncertainty in the rainfall that affects whether or not you can close the water balance. So it's not only um, the ET data that is affecting how well a water balance can close. So the other product that we need for the water productivity um, evaluation is the biomass uh, product on the VAPOR database. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of institute data to evaluate whether or not the database is providing uh, good results. So we did something else. Um, yeah, we, we collected the biomass production from the WAPOR database, and we uh, collected for a number of fields, a number of uh, sites, we collected information on uh, the crop types, uh, the crop calendar, so the beginning and the end of the cropping season. And we looked at literature to identify the harvest index and the moisture content to be able to calculate what is the harvestable and fresh product. So that's basically the crop yield. And we compared that with uh, observed yields. And we checked whether or not this uh, comes in the right range. Um, so we did that for uh, a case study in Ethiopia. So this is a large irrigation system uh, for sugarcane where um, you, see, you see here the biomass production uh, in the area, and the green part is the, the irrigation field, and, and the surrounding areas are the red areas with very low biomass production. So we converted that to yield, and uh, you see in the top um, hand, uh, on the right hand, uh, the parameters we used for the analysis, and we compared that to the observed yields. So uh, our analysis showed that around uh, the average is around 100 ton per hectare, and we also found um, from the field managers that indeed the yield is on average about 100 ton per hectare. So this is a very good indication that the data or layer for the biomass is doing very well. We did a similar analysis uh, in Egypt uh, on the Fayoum irrigation system, where there are two, um, two main seasons, winter wheat and, and summer maize. And here, the average uh, from WAPOR, uh, we calculated, for instance, for wheat, 5 ton per hectare, and the literature gave 5 ton per hectare. Maize was a bit underestimated at 3 ton per hectare, but also uh, the literature value was slightly higher. Um, but we also realized that uh, we assumed that the whole area was wheat and the whole area was maize, and that's uh, probably not the case. I mean, you, you, it's very likely that the large part is also fallow. So um, there's some. If you, you need a little bit, uh, quite a lot of uh, field information to be able to make these analyses, but at least it's in the right order of magnitude, uh, and it comes out quite nicely. Um, so what do we actually see uh, from WAPOR? 
because WAPA provides their own water productivity layer. Um, at the first level, um, we get uh, the water productivity layer is an annual water productivity layer, so it just looks at the whole year what is the water productivity. At level two and three, it uses uh, a seasonal water productivity and even is able to provide two different seasons in a year. So how does Wapor derive this seasonality? Because it assumes the beginning and the end of, this, of the season. And it uses uh, what they call the phenology layer, which is a layer which is based on the NDVI, which is the normalized vegetation index, uh, to estimate the crop season. And you see here this, this image where uh, during the cropping season there's more biomass, more vegetation growing, and it actually picks up this change in vegetation as an, an indication of the start of a growing season and, and the, uh, the reduction of this vegetation at the end of the growing season. So it's using that layer as an input to identify what is the season and then it calculates the water productivity for that particular season. Um, but we also found that uh, if you do have uh, local information about the end, beginning and the end of the cropping season, uh, it's better to use that than to use the phenology layer because that phenology layer is highly uh, dependent on um, the cloud cover or it's affected by the cloud cover, the quality of it. So this is one that we already saw. So this is the, the portal that we're talking about um, where we have, uh, if, the, if you go to the left uh, bottom corner, you have a, a button that tells layers and you can select the different layers uh, and the different information that is available. So you can get it uh, you're visualized on your screen for the different layers. So that's how you find the different layers. In the catalog, you can see uh, all the different layers and a small introduction of what each of these layers uh, stand for. And if you click on one of these layers, um, you also find much more technical information. And there's also an option to download individual maps. Uh, one thing that I also want to point out is that uh, it's always good to read these descriptions, to really clearly understand what it is about. And sometimes some of these layers have conversion factors. For instance, the ET layer has a conversion factor of 0.1. So when you download it, you need to multiply it by 0.1 to get the right uh, unit. Um, so also you need to check uh, what is the unit. And I think even with the ET data, maybe Big can also confirm I think it's millimeter per day, so it's a decade. It's an average value over a decade. So if you want to know the total amount of millimeter over that decade, you need to multiply by the number of days in a decade, which I earlier also um, explained how yeah, that is not necessarily 10 in each of the decades. Uh, there's a couple of um, videos of the demonstrations of these videos. So even the two videos that some refer to in the introduction video, they are available on the, the Water Channel. I think we can make them available on our website. And then uh, our project website will maintain updated list of videos and resources. So um, yeah, this is just a very short list of the available uh, videos, but there will definitely be more if you want to see the latest ones. In the next couple of days, go to our website and, and keep track of what we're posting there and what we're uploading there. Thank you very much. Hi, Luz. That was a, a really nice overview about WAPOR, how it started, and the different ways that it's evolved over time. And I think it's always good to talk about the, the specifics um, so you know when you use this data, there are things that you have to keep in mind um, that when you compare it, the final results to other results. And it's good to know. So thank you very much for your nice presentation. Uh, now we'll move on to Pulad, and he will talk about WAPOR-based performance indicators. Hello. <coughs> Hi. Uh, thank you, Lauren. And, and thank you, Marius, for providing such a good introduction. It makes my life very easy, because I can always go back to what you describe in detail. So basically, one of the uses that we can have for the WAPOR database is actually to use them to do what we call uh, performance assessment using performance indicators. Why do we use this indicator? It's generally about when we have an irrigation system, we would like to uh, improve system operations. We would like to maybe know how far are we from our strategic goals. I mean, at the beginning, we have some goals. But then throughout the years, 
we have to see whether we have been able to achieve those goals or are we drifting away from the where we started. We could also use this to assist our management. I mean, as a day-to-day -day operation of the irrigation scheme, we can use these kind of indicators and performance assessment to guide those. We can also use that to 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 kind of look into the to the uh, general health of a system, and also when we do intervention before doing so, we can also see that whether the, the what are the impacts of the those interventions. And uh, it can also be used for the, say, other, other uses, especially what we call benchmarking. Benchmarking is a practice that we, to which we compare a system with other systems. Imagine you have 10 irrigation schemes. You want to know where your irrigation scheme A stands in comparison with the other nine, or how irrigation system A compares with its own performance over the years ago. So that is a practice in irrigation engineering or in irrigation management we call benchmarking. The overall goal of doing all these is to actually improve uh, productive use of land and water and also make sure that the quality of service delivery of irrigation is there. So these are why we do these all sort of uh, indicator-based operations and indica indicator-based uh, corrections. However, there are challenges. I mean, you. I mean, everybody likes to have all this information, but uh, in, in in reality, there are a lot of resources need uh, is needed to collect this extensive data. Those resources include time, labor, and also budget. There's also an issue of the lack of continuity. We can do one irrigation performance once, and then the next one maybe in ten years, if the irrigation scheme actually has enough funding and if enough resources to carry on that. Also, we don't have uh, or we have limited knowledge of the past. We know a bit about it today through this, informant, this uh, performance assessment, but we don't know how was the scheme five years ago. So we cannot really understand how the, the system has changed. And also what we do in physically doing it, in a, it would be limited for a small geographical extent, basically for an irrigation scheme or if you have a large budget for, for a district or a province at most. But what WAPAR has to offer here is that it offers freely available data on land and water and climate. So speaking to one of the issues that I was about the budget and then the time that it needs to collect that data. Uh, WAPAR offers continuous data. Data comes a decade old and then for uh, seasonal, annual, and then you can continuously keep monitoring the situation. It can provide a glimpse of the past. It goes, the data goes, back to 2009, so we would, at the moment, we would have 10, 10 years of data that to, to build up on. And also, it covers a large geographical extent. It covers continental scale analysis. So these are what Vapor would have to, to offer us to, to carry on uh, irrigation performance assessment in a new way. The way it works is that you have Vapor data, you have the land use land cover map coming from the same database. You have the, you can use the, your irrigation system boundary to extract information that you need for performance indicators. Those details will be explained by FIC to some extent today, and then of course uh, continued by a detailed uh, uh, training in the week after and this, I mean, uh, by, by Abedo, which actually goes through all these steps of how we extract this information. Uh, what we are being, we, what I want to show is a couple of indicators that are some of the indicators that we can we can quickly do and then use for this kind of analysis. This include water consumption. We look at it from through evapotranspiration, crop area, yield, reference evapotranspiration, beneficial fraction, equity, relative water deficit, relative yield reduction, and water productivity. These are the some of the some of the indicators that we can quickly calculate with using vapor and if you want to we want to show this with the with a case study in uh, in Beko Valley in Lebanon the first and most important to us as, as agro hydrologists are evapotranspiration it helps us to track water consumption that can be done through space and through time the graph to the to the left so shows seasonal ETA or actual evapotranspiration variation for winter wheat in Beko Valley you see the numbers are changing. So you don't have a continued or continuous number that is repeated every year. So that helps you to understand how evapotranspiration actual has changed over the years. We can also look into this from a spatial point of view. So you can pick up a year, 
pick up a season, pick up an average of a couple of years to see how spatially water consumption through evapotranspiration has changed. These are a lot of important information because you would know which part of your scheme is actually consuming more water or which part of your scheme has not received enough water to be able to do to provide the crops with the, with the required water. So that information you can benchmark and you can you can understand through this uh, through tracking of uh, evapotranspiration. Another indicator is crop area. It helps us to track the extent of the land with the use of land. So you would know in any particular season or year how much how many hectares of land has been under cultivation for for the for major crops. I mean at the moment. This crop map is provided by vapor at uh, 30 meter resolution for a selected area. But some of the time, at, at times, we can have that information also coming in from the secondary sources that we can use to support our analysis. Again, that can be looked upon as the, uh, the interannual changes or different seasons to see how it has changed. And if you look into the graph, you see how it is dynamic. I mean, say in 2013 and 14, the area under under cultivation of winter wheat in Bekaa Valley has about uh, is about 5,700 uh, hectares, whereas the year before is about 2,500. This is how dynamic some of the decisions are. And then, as irrigation engineers, as planners, as managers, we really need to know about these things. We really need to know whether the area is increased, the area is decreased, why they are happening, and then and then what are the reasons behind that and Hopefully that would help us to guide our intervention to improve the situation. The other important indicator is the yield. I mean, yield is the ultimate uh, information that a farmer requires because that speaks directly to how much livelihood they can make out of a hectare of land. So, uh, and tracking yield is important because it also is one of the SDGs. Like we want to increase the double double crop production, and then that has to happen in hand in hand with increase of the yield and the land productivity. So when we actually look into the yield, again, you see a lot of variation. So it's not that the yield is constant. An area could be going through different yield, different years. And then when we do this kind of analysis, we would understand what, we could take a step towards understanding what are the reasons behind this. And also, especially looking at the spatial distribution of yield also gives us an idea of what are the, what are the areas or spots that produce more yield and what are the, which are the areas that produce less yield. Then we can go ahead and then look into the reasons why some areas lag behind, and then how can we help them to to improve. ET reference is another important indicator because it also tells us the uh, guide us through water allocations. Because crop water demand traditionally has been decided using uh, crop coefficient times uh, the uh, ET reference. So in that case. When we actually make those decisions, it would be good for us to see how the, the reference evapotranspiration has changed over time and how is that correlates with the change of evapotranspiration actual in the same area. Another important uh, indicator is beneficial fraction. It tracks the system's efficiency in turning water consumption into benefits because it looks into the transpiration part of the ET as opposed to evaporation. Per definition, evaporation happens from soil surface and transpiration through plant. And only transpiration contributes to biomass production, which is our beneficial use. So through this doing and then tracking beneficial fraction, we understand how efficient is our system towards translating water use to biomass production, which gives us direct benefits. We could also look into equity. Equity is a very important uh, indicator. It tells us how fair is water distribution, how equitable has been our plans and uh, operational irrigation towards making sure that all the farmers have access to water with the amount that they need. If you see, this, this graph shows how equity has changed over time in, in Becca Valley in the, for irrigated winter wheat. And you see, I mean, the area in red is the area that is rather critical. You don't want to go there. It's, these decisions are where, where the critical point to start is rather arbitrary. You have to take on, I mean, you can consider your local situation, local target, or you can look into the general literature. Generally, we say something between below 10 is, is the target, between 10 to 
20 or 17 or that, that, that range is, yeah, is the reality and acceptable. But anything past that is a critical point that you would like to have improved. We could also look into relative water deficit, which tracks the irrigation water adequacy. It, it shows us how much of uh, water in comparison with the, with the maximum development transportation has been available through each, uh, through different space, different places in an irrigation scheme. Here you see again the changes of the relative water deficit through, through years. You see in some years the water, there has been a huge deficit in water. In other years there have been less deficit. And you can also look into this especially and see what are the areas that are, that are more affected by the lack of availability of water. You could also go back to calculating the yield reduction. I mean, this is, I'm, I'm glad that Pasquale is also joining us here in, the, in, the, in this webinar. This work comes from his, his publication of FAO 66, where there, the simple calculate, um, equation has been introduced to relate uh, relative water deficit to relative yield reduction. And if you look into the, I mean, to, to, the, to the graph to the right, you see how a linear relationship can, can define, can, can, be, can be made between uh, the, the relative yield reduction and relative water deficit. And KY is actually our crop uh, yield factor. And then if you compare that to the half for Becca Valley through this practice 1.06, and interestingly enough, the number that has been uh, uh, suggested as global, like kind of average in, in FAO 66, uh, is 1.05, which shows how how this some of these uh, empirical relationships are actually quite quite accurate, and how can they be used to represent uh, to to be used to understand how yield reduction may happen because of water deficit. These kind of relationship can be used easily. Say, if we no doubt next year we have 20% water reduction, then then do what you need. What would be really our yield reduction? Very important factors for our planning and for, for decision making when it comes to allocation and deciding how much deficit may have to be given in different sectors. And last but not least is the water productivity and that tracks productivity of use of water. And you see, I mean, generally it changes through years. In Becca Valley, we see a general increasing trend in water productivity that from, from 2009 to 2019. So, and then also you can see how especially this distribution is uh, within the within the Bicca Valley uh, in, in Lebanon to help us to understand where we should focus and then where are the good spots and what we learn from them and what kind of things or intervention can be used to improve the spots that are, are having lower water productivity. In summary, WAFR offers free continuous and data that covers a very large geographical area and starts in 2009. This data can be used to track irrigation performance, both spatially and temporally, through years, through seasons, and show us where the locations are for the hot spot and bright spot. And also, these that information of the irrigation performance assessment can be used for benchmarking and planning actions for improvement. Uh, there are sources that I've used in this uh, presentation, uh, all open source, EMI and FAO publication. You can just click on the, on the, on the blue links and then get all the, the documents to, uh, to kind of give you a little bit, bit more uh, insight into the theory that is behind these indicators. Thank you so much. Thanks, Bulat. I think that was a, it was a nice extension from your talk last week about um, how parameters change at different scales. And now we talk about how we can measure those parameters using the WAPOR data. So thank you. And now I think we'll move on to Vic. And I'll give her a few moments to introduce herself in the video and what we'll be learning. Hello, everyone. Um, I think you can just play the video. <laughs> uh, I will explain more in the video. Hello everyone, my name is Bic, and in this video I will show you how to use the analysis tool on Vapor Portal. You can use this uh, to extract point time series, area time series, or water productivity raster of an area. I will now demonstrate how to extract time series data for a point on Vapor Portal. 
We can do that using the Analysis tool on the left corner here. Before clicking on the Analysis button, we need to change to the data layers that we want to extract time series. For example, now we are looking at the gross biomass water productivity. If you want to extract monthly actual evapotranspiration and interception, you will need to click on the Layers button and select Actual Evapotranspiration and Interception Monthly. To extract time series data, you don't need to change the month layer, so we can leave it for now. After that, we can open the Analysis tool and select Point Time Series. Now, under the Place tab, click on Select Point. You can either select a point that you have saved before or uh, add a new point. Under the New Point tab, you can fill in the latitude and longitude coordinates of the point you want to extract time series data. For example, I have this point. And then click Select. To save this point for later use, click on Save in My VAPO. You will need to sign up for a VAPO account and log in to do this. Then give the point a name and save it. Now under the time period um, tab, you need to specify the time period you want to extract time series. For example, let's extract data from 2009 until the end of 2010. Similarly, you can save in my VAPO uh, this time period. Let's name it period 2. After that, click Run Operation. It might take a while to process, depends on the internet connection. Then you can have this uh, graph of monthly data for the selected period. To save this um, time series data, you can click on the button on the right corner of the plot and choose Download CSV. And then a CSV file is downloaded. You can click on this to open in Excel, for example. Uh, here we see uh, the date and the value separated by comma. So I will um, convert text to column in delimited mode to separate um, the date and the value by comma. After that, you will have two columns of data. Now go back to the portal. In case you don't have the exact coordinates of the location you want to extract time series, you can use the locate tool to search for a name of city or place of interest. For example, now I will search for Beka Valley in Lebanon. After that, the portal will show a point in Lebanon Valley. Sorry, in Beka Valley. Another way is to click on any point on the map. For example, I want to select different points in Beka Valley. Whenever, uh, whichever point you click, you can choose point time series to open the same analysis window and follow the same step to generate time series. I will now demonstrate how to extract time series data for an area on VAPO portal. First, you need to make sure that you are selecting the data layer that you want to extract time series. In my case, I want to extract time series data for actual evapotranspiration and interception monthly. Then we can open the analysis tool and select Area Time Series. Under the Place tab, click Select Area. You can choose an area that you have saved before in the My Areas tab or adding a new area. You have two options. One is to draw and second is to upload a shape file. If you want to draw an area, click on Draw. Here you will start drawing uh, the area that you want to extract time series. 
when you click you can select a point and drag to draw new lines and continue until the last point is connected to the first point creating a closed boundary you can also save this area for later use using save in my bubble button if you have a shape file of your area you can choose uploading a shape file let's try that by select a new area Here we need a zip file that contains a valid shape file. For example, I have these shape files with uh, the mandatory extension files. I will select all of them and send to a zip file. After that, back to the portal, I can click choose and select the zip file and upload it to the VAPO portal. Here I'm asked to confirm the geometry. Uh, you will need to check the shape and the location on the map to make sure that the shape file is correctly uploaded. After that, uh, we can click, click confirm. Now I will save this new area as Zinavan. After that, you will need to select a time period to extract data. This is similar to point time series analysis. For this, I choose the time period that I have saved before. Then I can click run operation. On the right corner, you can see the status of processing. Once it show completed, click on the green button. Here you will receive the time series data for the area. So there will be three values, average and a range from minimum to maximum. Similarly, you can click on the button next to the plot to save CSV file. I will now demonstrate how to calculate crop water productivity rasters for a specific crop area on VAPO portal. You can do this for an area of crop where you know the crop specific parameters. For this example, I'm going to use the national 100 meter data layer. I will open the analysis tool and select area of water productivity. In the place tab, click select area. You can create a new area or use an area you have saved. In this case, I will use a shape file of sugarcane crop in Zinavan. Here you can see the plots of sugar cane. Now in the time period tab, you can choose the start and the end date of crop season. For example, in my area, the crop season starts approximately from 1st of October until the uh, last day of September of the next year. Therefore, I will select the period from 1st October 2009 until 30th of September 2010 for the crop season starting in 2009. I will save it as season two. Under the advanced option tab, you can customize the crop specific parameters to calculate crop water productivity. These are light use efficiency, LUE, harvest index, uh, above growth over total biomass ratio, and moisture content ratio. You can also refer to the explanatory notes for details of the computation. 
in these notes uh, you will find the definitions of these crop parameters and the formulas used to calculate uh, crop yield and water productivity rasters back to the portal in the select crops list uh, you will find some common crops types uh, if you choose one of those crops, the reference values for crop-specific parameters will be automatically filled. For example, in my area, the crop is sugarcane. So when I select sugarcane, you can see the common values for sugarcane crop parameters are filled. Here, the LUE value for sugarcane is 1.8 since it is a C4 crop. If you cannot find your crop in the select crop list, you will need to determine the crop parameters of your crop type either from literature or field measurements. After filling the crop parameters, I can click Run Operation. Once the processing is completed, you can click on the green button here and you will see that there are three links to download three rasters. In the explanatory notes, you will find the explanation of these results. The raster with AETI code is the total actual evapotranspiration and interception of the crop during the selected season in cubic meter per hectare. The raster with TBP code is the yield generated from the growing season based on the specific crop parameters in kilogram in per hectare. And lastly, the raster with GBWP code is the crop water productivity. Um, notice that this has a scaling factor of 1000, which means after downloading the raster, you will need to divide the raster by 1000 to get the value in kilogram per cubic meter. For example, now I will download the crop water productivity raster. I can open this raster in QGS. Here I add a raster layer and select a downloaded crop water productivity raster. After that, I can use a QGIS raster calculator to convert the downloaded raster into kilogram per cubic meter by divided by 1000. Then I will save the result raster. And that is the end of this demonstration. If you have some questions, please ask in the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you, Big, for that, that nice video. I think it was nice to see a step-by-step -step explanation of, of how to use the portal, how to download different data types, uh, where to find things. So um, we encourage people, if you have not used the portal before, go check it out and try and find data for your area and, and different parameters that you're interested in. And, I, you know, practice makes perfect. So you can always practice. And if you have questions, you can contact us or, or the, the WAPOR team. So I think now we will move on to the question and answer session. So you guys have been very active in the chat, which is great. It's really great to see. I think some people have had their questions answered by some of the presenters uh, in real time, but I think some will be nice to open for a group discussion. So let's start with a question for Bic from Kaiji. Can we add new points at the subnational level and extract the data through a shape file or CSV file? I think Livia from FAO has the answer for the question in the chat box. So the level three data uh, products is not uh, in uh, longitude and latitude um, spatial reference system, but it is in UTM. So I think if you put lot um, uh, longitude and latitude in, in, in the toolbox, it will show invalid uh, coordinates. So I think, can uh, can you go back to the previous chat box? I mean, the new one. 
I, I think if, uh, Libya has the answer to this question. Yeah, is it possible to add Livia as a presenter so she can answer this question? Yes, I'm just trying to do that. Uh, Livia, right? Livia, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, in the chat box she said that there's no coordinates on level three yet because it's I in have, UTM. I have made Livia presenter. Livia, if you could please uh, activate your webcam and your microphone using uh, uh, the webcam and the microphone buttons at the top of this uh, of the screen, at the top of uh, the webinar window. It's just above where you see the speakers. In the meantime, I will uh, try and pull up the latest chat window. I just while we're waiting, I see a lot of questions on where we can find the recording, where can we find the presentation, different references Hello? that were made. Um, yeah. All of that will be available on Hello? the project website as well as the waterchannel.tv. So you can find those um, a few hours after we finish the webinar. Those resources okay. will be available. Now online. I think Livia. Yes, we can hear you, Livia. You can. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I was uh, yeah clicking buttons randomly. But <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'll make it short. So coordinates uh, uh, entry at level three is not available uh, at the moment because that's because level three data come in uh, in uh, um, UTM specific uh, projection for the for the specific level three area. So there was no standard coordinate system that we could use, but it's not too difficult to implement if user find it necessary. So the idea was that at that level, we normally know the area already. So it's, uh, it was less relevant at level three to, to, to find points based on coordinates that's on level two and uh, level one. But we, we have a priority list of, uh, of uh, uh, functionalities to add to the portal. So please um, send those requests to vapor at fau.org and we will prioritize and, and, and try to, to you know, uh, apply those changes when we can. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, in addition to uh, Livia's answer, uh, I think for level three, you can check the um, reference system on the catalog. Uh, if you go to catalog subnation, uh, in the description, there will be the information on the spe spatial reference system. If you have the coordinate in this system, you can uh, use this on the portal instead of latitude and longitude. Yeah. Great, thanks, Dick, and thanks, Livia, for for clarifying the the answer on that. It's always nice to have um, additional capabilities. So, as you use the the portal, please let the FAO team know how things can be improved in the future. Um, okay, we have a few questions that are related to the equity indicator. So, I yeah, think sure, Hula, you. maybe you can uh, go. I, I put a small note on the chat box, but anyway, I mean, we actually calculate. It. Uh, equity based on the coefficient of variation of evapotranspiration. So basically, we are. At, I mean, in 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 the old ways, you look into the service delivery and delivery to the to the fields at the farm gates to understand uh, equity. However, we actually, when you actually look at this from the consumption point of view, you can use evapotranspiration actual as a replacement because if a farmer has access to water, there's likelihood that that the evapotranspiration of actual would be much higher than the situation that there is lack of water. So we use evapotranspiration actual per field as a, as a proxy to calculate our, our equity. And to do that, we look into coefficient of variation. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, there, there, they, Wait, there, the are there other they resources be, yeah, that people wanted the, the to read up that on this, this, this indicator? Can be found, uh, if 
Okay, great. And we'll put that on the website also so people can see that. Okay, next question is for Marluz. To avoid the over or underestimation, WAPOR is a suitable tool in less tropical regions without irrigation systems and where evapotranspiration is high. Is this um, well, I mean, WAPO works better in, in other areas. That's indeed true. Uh, I think one of the, the, the key things is that you need to realize that uh, the ET data and also the biomass is, is dependent on uh, cloud-free images. And what I also showed in the, the higher or the lower resolution um, levels, so level one and two, they're more overpass time. So one image can be replaced by another. If you have one cloud cover image, you know, you, within the 10 days, you at least have one clear uh, image. Whereas in the 30 meter resolution data, you have only once in every 16 days um, um, overpass time. If that one turns out to be cloudy, there's a lot of gap filling taking place. So um, in general, in, in more humid climates, you get more cloudy images and, and images with missing data, and there's a lot of interpolation taking place. So there's a bit of a, a challenge in terms of um, yeah, the data. So that's one of the reasons why the humid climates are uh, more problematic than the drier climates. Uh, I also mentioned in the chat box, it depends also on your application. Do you need the absolute value of these ET, or do you need to have a trend? Uh, Pulat showed uh, in his presentation that a lot of the analysis are about trends. Uh, so if it's all, you know, 20% higher than, uh, than the absolute value, the trend would still show the same uh, response. Um, so there are, uh, in, in any case, you need to use remote sensing data with a bit, with a bit of a, um, you know, you need in mind that it's not, you know, it's not an absolute value and it's not 100% accurate. Uh, but you do can you still can use it even if there's a bit of a bias. But you need to keep that in mind when you're using it. Thanks, Marlis. Appreciate that answer. Uh, this is a question for Vic. To make crop maps, we need to validate classifications. Can I consider the WAPOR data sufficient to validate? I don't know. It sounds more like a question for Pulat, I would say. Uh, actually, uh, I actually did answer this one in the, in the chat box. Yeah, crop maps. I mean, like the, the crop, <laughs> I mean, the ground validation is important. So wherever, I mean, the, these maps are made. Uh, some of them are. I mean, you have valid. It's been validated, and this, and the some of the some of the points are used to to train the model. But it would be interesting for your own area to actually do this, and then let us know the results. We would be very much interested to see how your validation results look like, and then how accurate do you find these maps. Very nice. I know it's it's always difficult to get on the ground and, and do ground truth things. So it's really nice when you have a big network of people in different places that we can all work together and, and improve the, the data sets. Okay, a question from Yusuf. Currently, it's difficult to upload shape files directly into the database and then download the data. Is this a common problem? Um, I think I can, can answer this question. Um, I sometimes have problem with uploading shapefile, but uh, you can. The problem is that the shapefile is not valid. So when I often use QGIS to uh, verify the shapefile before uploading, and in the video you will see that you need to uh, compress not only the shapefile but also all the mandatory extension files with it in the zip file before uploading. So I hope this will help uh, solve your difficulty. And it also seems like you can save yeah. that shape file in the so, WAP for in your yeah, You better save it uh, in five up so you don't have to upload it again. Perfect. <laughs> uh, okay, I think we just answered this question. Maybe Abraham, uh, we can get a new question. We just discussed the, the crop maps. Uh, oh, here's a good one. Does the quality of water matter when using WAPOR? 
Sure, yeah, and not at the moment. The I mean, blood? quality of water is actually very important, but it's not one of the one of the indicators that, or it's not among the information that you can get from vapor. Because I mean, vapor is largely remote sensing based, and remote sensing has its own. I mean, there are things that you can measure through remote sensing about water quality, but it's yet. Uh, I mean, it's not that accurate and operational that we can use to this extent. But it's a very important factor, and likelihood is that you would have to add that information from your own ground observation or a network that you may have for water quality into your own specific use. Okay, thanks. thanks for that clarification on water quality. Um, a new question, why are these data only available? I think we have to ask uh, Olivia that again now. <laughs> Olivia, you want to say? Uh, would you like to answer that question? Olivia, are you still with us? She's typing. We can take the next question while she's answering the question. Yeah. We can take the next question. Uh, I'm trying to see. Livia, you would need to, uh, uh, to click on the microphone button again. When it turns green, then uh, you can speak and we'll be able to hear you. OK, I'll just take the next uh, question. Will Sentinel-2 data be used in WAPO in the future? So um, the current project that developed the WAPO database is ending this Working year. Now? And there have been discussions yeah. already um, on this, the second phase. Yes, we can hear you. Let me fin finish this question, and you take it from there. So the, the, the second phase is coming up, and there are, and maybe it's even related to the question that we asked Livia, um, uh, there are talks about extending the, the aerial coverage um, as well as uh, using uh, Sentinel-2 data uh, for these analysis, because the proba v um, satellite is, is having some issues. So there are some uh, challenges with the current um, satellite input data, and, and yeah, one of the discussions is about Sentinel-2 data. Okay, Livia, back to you. Livia, would you like to respond to the previous question now? No? Can you? Oh, okay, sorry, I don't. I still fail to understand yeah. how yeah. this works. But uh, no, Marlus replied already, and uh, that's that's correct. Uh, we we are looking for additional partners for, uh, well, and also yeah, in general, we, we we would like to grow to other continents and also, of course, uh, higher integration of uh, Copernicus uh, data in, in in the system. So we are working on it and. Um, of course, the more demands we have from users from from countries, the better it is for us to 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 uh, understand what is useful. So again, uh, if you have any specific uh, sound uh, request on on having vapor data in other areas, uh, you can try direct that to to vapor at uh, org and it will help us uh, shape our new strategies. Thank you. Okay, and I also saw, yeah, I saw the comment from Job. The focus was on water scarce areas in the first place. Job was yeah, one of the, you know, the <laughs> bright ideas behind the, the project. So he he was there at the beginning, so he knows best. So the focus was on water scarce areas in the first place. So that's why they started with Africa and the Middle East. Uh, we did have a few other questions, but they were answered in the chat. Uh, so perhaps uh, we could wrap this up. Uh, yeah, sounds good. We had really nice discussions. Uh, we appreciate uh, both the discussions in the chat and also the questions that were answered as a group. I want to thank everyone who attended today, and I would like to thank also the, the presenters and, and Livia, who came in as a presenter at the end, um, for your, your really nice work. So before we log off, I would like to remind people that we are gathering information on a survey, and this survey will just you know, it gives us a chance to find out more information about who you are, 
how you use WAPOR and any ideas that you have for future webinars that we can go into more detail with. So um, the link to the survey we will put in the chat box, but as you exit the webinar, will also automatically take you there uh, via a web page. So thank you again to everyone, and thank you, Abraham, for, for being our, our tech support. And we hope to see you again next week, same day on Wednesday at 12 p.m. in Central Eastern Time.